Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. As I'm sure many of you noticed, I've been gone for a while, and I want to apologize for my absence. I had some personal issues come up that, while thankfully not extremely serious, did require my attention and kept me from feeling like I could devote my energies to casting. Most of that's under control now, and I'm glad to be back with new casts, and I intend to be releasing new content on a regular basis. That said, there may be a string of shorter casts, like this one on a grape variety, for a bit while I continue to get my feet under me, and unfortunately I've had to put my study of Italian wine on hold, though I'm still hoping to cast on Italian subjects when I get the chance. Hopefully it won't be too long before I'm back in full swing and releasing casts on subjects across the wine spectrum, and at all levels of depth and complexity. So, with that out of the way, let's get on to this cast on a great variety that often gets overlooked, Petit Verdot. Petit Verdot comes by its name, which is slightly archaic French for something like Little Green One, honestly, since it's a late ripening variety that typically hangs green longer than most of the varieties it's planted with in a given region. And, even when it does get the hang time that it needs, it's still susceptible, particularly in cool climate regions, to inconsistent ripening that can leave many of the berries on its bunches green, making it a challenging grape to work with, both from a logistical as well as a viticultural standpoint. In terms of its place of origin, while it has a multi-century association with Bordeaux, where it remains, along with Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, and Carmenere, one of the six permitted red grapes for that region's wines, it isn't likely to have originated there. Why the doubt? Well, partly because it's only tangentially related to the other important red grapes in the region lying outside of what some writers have called the Cabernet subgroup of the House of Carmenet from an old name for Cabernet Franc, the progenitor of most of those grapes, but also because as a very late ripening grape, it's never been particularly well suited for cultivation in the relatively cool Bordeaux region. All of that said, while it's not closely related to the Cabernet grapes, the most recent genetic evidence suggests that it's not unrelated to the so-called House of Carmenet, and thus to that group of grapes, and the most widely held theory at the moment holds that our grape may be native to an area just a bit south of Bordeaux, near the Pyrenees, both because that would help account for a warmer climate origin, and also because there's evidence to suggest that it's related to other grapes from that region, like Gros Verdot. On this account, Petit Verdot's parents remain unidentified, but there's an alternate, though no longer as widely held claim, that Petit Verdot descends from a grape of southeastern European, specifically Albanian origin, called Beliska, and that its other parent is as yet unknown. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the extremely confusing and likely erroneous claim that you'll see online quite a bit if you dig enough, that Petit Verdot's parents are actually a little-known grape, Tresso Noir, and a slightly better-known grape, Duras. As far as I can tell, someone got their wires crossed, and as is common in the wine world, the mistake was copied and pasted. And the real story is that Petit Verdot and Duras are the parents of Tresso Noir. Duras, incidentally, seems to be a native to an area not far from the Pyrenees region, specifically to the Tarn Valley near Toulouse, and the fact that it crossed with Petit Verdot at some point in its history bolsters the claim that Petit Verdot may have its origins in the same neck of the woods. So where is Petit Verdot found these days? Well, all over really, with the best known though not most extensive plantings found in the Bordeaux region. After a long period of decline in hectares under vine, remember this grape is tough to work with in a cool climate like Bordeaux's, there's been an uptick in plantings and conservative estimates put the land under vine there to this grape at around 400 hectares or 980 or so acres. Australia probably has the largest plantings in the world with around four times as much land under vine to the grape than Bordeaux does, and California has about twice as much land under vine than Bordeaux. There are plantings in other U.S. states, with the most significant ones probably in Washington, Arizona, Texas, and Virginia, and there are also plantings elsewhere in the wine world, especially in places where red wine blends in the Bordeaux style are made, like South Africa and Chile, but also in countries like Spain, where that style of blend is less common. Speaking of blends, that's the style to which most of the world's Petit Verdot is put, largely because it's a grape that produces wines that have a lot of tannin, have deep color, and pack a wallop of concentrated, dense flavor. A wine with these characteristics, particularly the dense flavors, can be helpful in filling out varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, for instance, that are sometimes described as hollow or, more imaginatively, donut-shaped, and that can feel like they're missing something in the mid-palate, something that Petit Verdot can add. 
The most famous blends that use Petit Verdot are those that come out of the Bordeaux region, but even here it tends to be used sparingly, almost like a condiment to add just a little something to a blend and not to dominate it. In fact, most chateaux that still use Petit Verdot in their blends only use it for around 1-3% to of the total wine in the bottle, with a notable exception being the highly regarded third growth Chateau Palmer that will sometimes let our grape make up as much as 6% of the blend. Staying with our theme, Petit Verdot also turns up in worldwide blends that are a deliberate imitation of the Bordeaux style, including blends going under the rubric of Meritage. But our grape is a versatile blender, and it doesn't just pair well with its cousins from Bordeaux, and it can turn up in all sorts of interesting places with all sorts of interesting partners, as in this terrific blend with Syrah from Spain's ever-inventive Marques de Grignon. Though it's best known and most widely used as a blender, more and more it's taking on an identity as a varietal wine, and when it's made that way, it usually presents with dark color, full body, and tannins that run from the high end of medium on up. The nose will be floral, with a marked dark flower, think violet's character, and you may also find notes of smoke, dried plum, blackberry, and vanilla that will appear again on the palate. Though there are a handful of chateaux that produce varietal bottlings of Petit Verdot in Bordeaux, as well as some houses in Spain that do the same, you're really going to want to look to the New World, particularly Australia, the U.S., and Chile for such bottles. What should you drink with your nice bottle of PV? It's a big, deep, and dense wine, so match it up with big, deep, and dense dark meats, or even with lighter meats that are heavily seasoned, and with vegetable dishes that have a strong umami character, like preparations involving lots of mushrooms or slow-roasted root vegetables. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. I'm glad to be back casting on what I hope will be a regular basis. And thanks to all of you for continuing to support my channel in my absence by watching, liking, and recommending my casts. If this cast was helpful and interesting to you, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And always feel free to leave a comment, a thought, or a question, and I promise I'll respond as soon as possible. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.